what are those matchups for you? Do you got any? Well, I really want to see Yoel Romero get a shot at the title. <laughs> You know, well, and I know he's waiting. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, he's waiting right now for this. What I think is an interesting fight between Michael Bisping and George St. Pierre. I think that's an interesting fight. I don't like it in terms of the hierarchy of the division. You know, I think that for the as far as the division goes, it's 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 not good at all. I mean, it, it sort of hijacks the whole situation. So how, but, how are you gonna how are you gonna feel when after St. Pierre wins the title he fights Anderson Silva? I don't think he's going to, and I don't think he's going to. I mean, I don't think he's. If, I think if he wins the title, I think he's probably going to vacate it and fight someone else, some, another big money fight. Yeah. If I had a guess, yeah, I definitely don't know. But if I yeah. had a guess, I would think he's probably going to do that. Well, when they're sitting up there at the press conference, you know, I actually asked Dana White that exact question. Uh, you know, do you have any reservations about booking somebody to a title fight that he might not want to defend? And and Dana White basically told me that, you know, hey, we've had these conversations. We have plans. We're just not telling you them right now. My question to you is, <laughs> Joe, my question to you is, and I guess, I guess that response speaks for itself and to a certain extent. That sounds like what something my dad would say. <laughs> <laughs> We're not telling you. We know how to do it. You shut up and go to bed. <laughs> How do you feel about all this? You know, it's something that we've been talking about a lot this year. There's interim titles everywhere you look. There's there's guys chasing like money it. fights. Yeah, I don't how do you, like it. You think it's a slippery slope, and and the, you are you actually concerned? 100%. I guess are you concerned with the direction the sport's going? I'm not concerned because there's great fighters, and you get them together, and you make great fights. I'm not concerned at that. But from a purist point of view, and from someone who feels like, look, if you're going to have a champion and you're going to have these divisions where one man rules over the division, there should be a very clear hierarchy. I mean, this was something that really bothered me about the Ronda Rousey-Amanda Nunes fight. I'm like, look, you're doing all these amazing promos. They're fantastic, but you're only highlighting this one fighter. You're only highlighting Ronda Rousey. Like, the other woman is the champion. She's the champion of the world. And that's a very important distinction. And that has to be respected. And if you, if you have a champion and you have, you know, all these people that are waiting in line to get a shot at that champion, the person who is perceived to be the best in that division is the one who should be fighting the champion next. The, the, the champion should always be fighting the number one available challenger right now that is yoel romero yeah. i get that george st pierre has come back and i get that michael bisping feels like he deserves a big money fight and i agree with him michael's had a long career in the ufc and he's a great fighter and he's i mean against all odds became the ufc middleweight champion on a very short notice fight against uh, a guy who had already beat him in the first round and luke rockhold and he winds up knocking him out all props to him comes back you know, he defends against Dan Henderson. I mean, beats him in a decision. Good for him. It's great. I, I think I see Michael Bisping's point that he deserves that big money fight. Yeah. But as a person who deeply respects the position of, of champion, I think if you're gonna if you're gonna do this, if you're gonna do this this whole interim title thing, and you're gonna have guys come come back after being out of the sport for three years and get a shot right at the title, why have, why have championships at all? Ooh, I swore. What happens when when you swear? You guys have a beeper over there? Yeah, we got. We'll, we'll, you'll be beep there. All right. My my apologies. <laughs> no, yeah, no I problem. Do a podcast. But why why have a champion at all? I mean, it just set up great fights. And if you're just setting up great fights, well, that's a great fight. You yeah. Know, Bisping versus GSP is a great fight. But if you're if you're going to have a title, this is the champion of the world. Then the champion should be defending his title against the number one challenger in the world. And that right now is Yoel Romero. But 100%. more people by far know who George St. Pierre is and Yoel Romero, so Michael Bisbing will make more money. It's a lucrative fight for George St. Pierre to come back to. I, it was, I think WME and uh, whatever this – I mean, what, what do they call the company now? It's not, do they still call it Zufa? I, should I believe know so. This, huh? Work for them. <laughs> what, what, is, what does your check say when you get it? I don't look at it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's Zufa. <laughs> he's got, I think he's got direct I'm deposit on that. <laughs> 
Yeah, I'm busy. Uh, <laughs> but I think that I, I think that look, it's it's two. There's two ways I look at it. One, I look at it like, man, I can't wait to see what happens. George St. Pierre versus Michael Bisping. Yeah, I'm I'm down. I, if that was on pay per view, 100 percent, I would buy that. Yeah. Like if I was just sitting at home and you told me that Bisping was going to fight George St. Pierre tonight, I'd be like, all right. Yep. That's great. Get the popcorn. Let's get the party started. But when it comes to someone who respects the position of champion, well, the champion should really be fighting the number one challenger. And, you know, Michael says that he's going to fight George. And then six weeks later, he said he'll be ready to fight um, Yoel Romero right afterwards. But that's, I wouldn't believe that if I was Yoel Romero. <laughs> when was the last time anybody ever did that? Has anybody ever defended the title <laughs> against a, 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 a former world champion and an all-time great? And then six weeks later, defend the title again? I mean, come on, get out of here. I'm That's sure happening. I'm sure that Michael Bisping is going to get the biggest payday of his career and want to hop right back yeah. into camp for a guy like Yoel Romero. <laughs> that, seems, that seems very reasonable to me. I see him drunk in Vegas <laughs> and, and those... Uh, <laughs> and like an English flag underwear, you know, having a great time. Yeah, I, th- well, I think he's going to make a giant payday, and that's that's good for him. I get it. What, a, there's, there's a real argument. It's a real argument that there shouldn't be champions. You know, I've I've heard this argument before, and and I've uh, entertained it, and I've actually brought it up myself. That really, what we need instead of this idea of a belt is just match the best fighters against the best fighters and have these cards. Like, if, if you had an amazing card, like UFC 200, but there was no title fights, you didn't, you didn't call them title fights, you just had to fight. You know, if you just had Conor McGregor versus Rafael Dos Anjos or whoever it would be, would you, do you really, how much is that, how much is that title of champion? weighing on your decision whether or not you're going to be enjoying it or whether or not it's going to be interesting or whether or not it's important. I actually think it's extremely important because when you look at like a, a, a matchup like McGregor and Rafael Dos Anjos, why are they big? You know, it's Dos Anjos because he won the title. He was considered a champion. He was considered the best of his of his weight class. With Connor, you know, even as he was coming up with his personality and everything that went with it and his, the, the great knockouts, he was chasing a dominant champion in Jose Aldo. That was always sort of the, the underlying story. And that's why I get I get a little worried about the future of the sport. I get it. I get why they're putting on big fights. And I can't even say that if it wasn't my company and I was wearing the suits and I was, you know, trying to make numbers meet, that I wouldn't be doing the exact same thing. But I think long term, if you take away the significance of your titles, you're taking away a lot of 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 what what keeps the UFC running. You know, it's just that storyline of like, Mm. this is what these guys are going for. They're going for that one that that is the end of the tunnel. That's the light at the end of the tunnel. That's what they're all chasing. So all the storylines sort of play off of that. And then once they won it, then you can create those fun fights. Like GSP, Michael, uh, Michael Bisping, if there's no title attached to it, everyone's still watching that fight. But you have to sort of get there first. You have to be those, like you can sell that storyline of two former champions or two champions, you know, super champions, whatever the case is. I still think it's a sport that's based on being number one at the top. And then those storylines start to percolate from that. I, I agree with you. And I also disagree with you. I, do, I agree <laughs> with you in that. Uh, I, think, I think that, yeah, it is, it is a great thing to be the champion. And when Conor McGregor, uh, when he beat Eddie Alvarez and he wanted those two belts on him and he, you know, he wanted to be the champ champ. You yeah. know, he had this visual, this idea in his mind. I, I get it. I get why people are interested in that. But <clears throat> on the other hand, I look at it and I just want to see interesting fights. You know, on the other hand, what, what is it, what's important to me? I mean, maybe I'm a little jaded or maybe I'm just like too deep in the sport, but I, I don't, you know, when you have things like interim titles, as soon as you have an interim title, you know, and then you have an interim title like they were going to do with Tony Ferguson versus um, uh, Habib Nurmagomedov. That, that's a fight where the guy just won the title. I mean, he just won the title a couple of months ago. And then yep. all of a sudden you're having an interim title. Like, what are you doing? Like, what is – either the guy vacates the title or he doesn't. Like, this whole interim thing. Like, I don't understand what an interim title – I get an interim title if a guy's injured. And yet, like, the Dominic Cruz situation, he has a significant layoff and he wants a, you know – they, they want to give someone else a chance to establish the fact that if Dominic Cruz cannot come back, this is your new champion. Or the John Jones situation, you know, where they stripped him of his title. And you have this, you know, this situation where when he comes back, they give him a shot at the interim title. I, I get all those things. I get it. I mean, it, may, it makes sense to me. But what I want to see is interesting and exciting fights. That's all I want to see. 
And uh, it doesn't matter. John Jones and Daniel Cormier fought tomorrow, and there was no title on the line. The UFC just decided, look, forget titles. I, it wouldn't mean anything to me. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious as to see how they're going to match up. Same with the, the new fight with him and Rumble. I just want to see how they match up. That's what I want to see. I think you're right. You don't need a title to know that a wolf against Arian Foster is an awesome fight. <laughs> Exactly. We have a, yeah, what is that, an interim human versus canine championship of the world? Dude, I'm so obsessed yeah. with this, and I saw you're having uh, you're having Arian Foster on. I cannot wait to hear this discussion. But just, can we get a preview, like your preliminary thought? That could not go well for Arian Foster, right? I don't think he understands what a wolf is. <laughs> I think the, the real problem is that wolves look like dogs. You know, it looks like a dog. And, like, you know how dogs listen and behave, and you're like, man, I'll kick that dog right in the face. <laughs> that dog's not going to get me. I don't think people really understand what a wolf is capable of doing. You know, I a friend of mine just uh, got some images from uh, some people that he knows in Kazakhstan. He's a, a flexibility coach, and he got um, he went to Kazakhstan to do some work with some people, some MMA fighters over there. And they sent him some pictures of uh, these wolves that torn apart these dogs that these people own. And when you see, like, a dog, literally a big dog, like a bulldog, like an American bulldog, bitten in half from a wolf, when you hear that a wolf can bite with a bite that's five times harder than a pit bull. I mean, most people don't know that. Five times harder. I mean, the pit bulls are the scariest dogs, right? Everyone's scared of a pit bull's bite. A wolf can bite five times harder than that. They tear apart moose bones. I mean, they can snap through a moose's femur. I mean, it's just not what you think it is. It, it is a pure killing machine, and they're so fast. Like, his idea that he's going to grab it by the neck, <laughs> it's going to tear apart that soft tissue <laughs> all around your arms so quickly. Your arms will be useless in a couple of snaps. And then that's a wrap. Your body is basically a water balloon, okay? <laughs> Your body is a giant blood water balloon with this really smushy, soft membrane called skin that's keeping all that blood from pouring out onto the ground. <laughs> and you're not a wolf. You're, you're, not a, you're not an elk. That wolf is going to snap at you, and your skin is going to tear open like wet toilet paper. I hear, I hear you. going <laughs> to... I hear you describing this. I hear you describing this, and it's like, uh, yeah, you know, a wolf would do this to a dog, and my reaction to it is, of course it would. It's a damn wolf. You know? How, who doesn't know, know this? No, Arian Foster said, who no. sits around here and says, like, oh, wolf? I, besides Arian Foster, I guess a lot but of he people, said, but that is insane to me. He said he can Google a wolf's weaknesses, and a wolf can't Google his, oh which I was like, God. yeah, I don't think that's going to help. That's, that, that is an advantage. <laughs> I guess that's an advantage. You look for advantages so where you can get them. Hey Joe, yeah, I, I don't we, understand what he's thinking. I really don't understand it. I know we got to let you go, man. We really appreciate the time. The last thing I wanted to ask you about before we let you go is how has this uh, how has this lightened schedule been for you? You know, it, it, you were doing. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, it's like yeah, is it no, like a, I, I enjoy it. It's like we hear a fighter say, you know, I'm not sparring as much in the gym anymore. It's added years to my career. I think I'm going to be doing this for a lot longer. Is that what it's doing for your commentating career? Yeah, I was. Uh, I do too many things. I, I'm very, very fortunate. And one of the things that I'm very fortunate at is that I have these interests. I have things that I really enjoy doing, whether it's doing stand up or doing podcasts or doing um, commentary for the UFC. I, I really enjoy doing all these things, and they're, um, you know, it just so happens that three of them are jobs for me. So I'm, I'm very busy. And when I was doing too many UFC broadcasts, it was just too much traveling. The traveling was the hardest thing. When you're flying to Brazil and you're flying to uh, Australia and you're flying to England and it's, your body just gets screwed up. I mean, the the time changes, the jet lag, the constant travel. I think one year I traveled 24 weeks for the UFC. We did 24 events and I was so burnt out. It was like every other week I was flying and I just was too, my body was like suffering from the effects of it and I was getting drained. And it wasn't that I didn't enjoy the fights. Once I was actually there and sitting down, I enjoyed it. But I have children, and I have a family, and I have other obligations, and it's just it was too much for me. And I'm just really thankful that the UFC has guys like Brian Stan now and Kenny Florian, and and now uh, Dominic Cruz and and um, uh, Daniel Cormier have been sitting in with me as well, doing commentary, which I really really enjoy. 
So uh, it's it's nice for me. I, I, I want to get down. I like to do like 10 a year, you know, like a little bit less than one a month and I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like a perfect, perfect amount. And, you know, I wasn't sure about the three man booth because just those words, the three man booth, sometimes it, it can be disastrous. But after listening, especially this last one with Cruz and yourself, um, you know, breaking down that fight that a lot of people didn't understand. And they're like, what is this? You know, these two guys are just kind of yeah. standing there. I thought it was I thought it was very good. So, um, hey, man, once again, thank you so much. We look forward to hearing your uh, your wolf talk with Harry and Foster later today <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and seeing you at a UFC card soon. Thanks again. My pleasure, man. We'll do this again when I have some more time. We, we could have, I mean, I think we probably talk for hours. There's so many different things to talk about. Absolutely. Sounds great to me. We'll do it soon. All right. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. All right.